Let's talk about less able students. Hi, my name is Dr. Ken Beattie. I'm a professor of education and a textbook writer. And I'm very interested in less able students. In every class that we teach, we always have some who are more able and some who are less able, with most of the students in the middle. There's a number of reasons for this, and in the last talk, we discussed seven reasons, seven factors that influence whether a student would be more able or less able. The important thing for us is to find strategies that can help us address the needs of those students. When working with less able students, however, there are also four other issues that we need to take into consideration. These are both physiological and psychological issues. Let's look at them one at a time. The first issue has to do with vision. In our classroom, we may find some students don't seem to be paying attention or don't seem to be very cooperative. Maybe they don't want to read what's written on the board or they don't even want to read their books. Well, of course, there can be many reasons for that. But the one that we have to rule out is vision, making sure that they don't need glasses in some cases. We can uh, always do other things as well, rearrange our class to allow students who want to sit close to the front to do so. But if you find that you suspect that a student has vision problems, maybe you should take that discussion a little bit further, first with the student, then perhaps with the parents. But you say, but don't the parents know if this child needs glasses or not? Often, surprisingly, they don't. They will consider their child, for example, someone who is a little clumsy. He's always bumping into things. Or uh, he won't read things. He doesn't like to read without investigating the core reason why. Associated with this are problems with hearing. And sometimes we find students do not pay attention or they don't want to participate in conversations or they don't listen to what the teacher is saying during class. Again, there can be many reasons for this, and I don't want to say that every student is perfect and, and every student who doesn't pay attention has a hearing problem, but we have to investigate this as well. A big clue is when we see students sometimes cupping their ear to sort of try to hear a little bit better. Again, Try investigating this with the students, maybe speaking quietly behind them to see if they really can pay attention to you or not. And again, if there are issues, discuss them with the students and maybe take them up with the parents as well. Again, wouldn't the parents know if the child had a hearing problem? Well, no, they don't always, they don't always know. And the reason why is because they find other excuses. They will say, Oh, my son, you know, he never listens to me, right? She never pays attention. And uh, this, again, are things that parents tend to believe rather than looking at a root cause, such as a hearing issue. The third issue has to do with speaking. And in terms of speaking, uh, we can often see if a child is having a particular problem if they have a physiological imperfection of sorts. So a cleft lip or a cleft palate is going to affect pronunciation. However, more so in a less able student, it's going to affect the desire to speak. They may be more self-conscious about speaking. In these cases, we have to look and see whether or not there's something else that we can do to provide the students opportunities to practice more, to prepare more. Maybe that's the student you don't call on first for an answer. Uh, you wait until that student puts up his or her hand to give the answer. This is showing a bit of compassion. And compassion also relates to the fourth point, which are those psychological issues that some students have. I like to call it their tender hearts. Yeah, 
because as teachers, we need to consider them and take care of them a little bit more. These are students who might have uh, a syndrome such as ADHD, which has to do with attention and not paying attention in class. It's simply because they're brains are on fire and they're thinking of too many things at a time and sometimes they can't concentrate. We have to find activities that are short-term, that suit their interests and that motivate them to want to learn. We also have to look at students who have other problems, mental problems, which affect their physiological production of speech. I'm talking specifically about stuttering. Students who stutter repeating their consonants, da, 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 that sort of thing, they are less likely to want to speak in a classroom because of the embarrassment that they will face. Again, we need to find opportunities for them to speak in a way that they feel comfortable. Surprisingly, students who stutter can sometimes memorize lines and overcome their stuttering. So give that opportunity to the students. So, those are some special conditions that we look at when we're looking at less able students. But a major, a major issue facing less able students is this, motivation. Motivation comes in two kinds. It's either intrinsic, inside you, because you want to do it, or it's extrinsic, because there are external pressures which make you want to do something. Internal pressures are just simply that burning interest, that great desire to experience something, to learn something new, to be curious, to have fun, and we have to be able to capture those in the classroom. Unfortunately, many of the pressures that students face in the classroom, especially teenagers, are external. They are getting pressures because of marks or because their teachers are having high expectations that they might not be able to meet, or because their parents or even their peers are putting pressures on them. Did you get an A in your class? Why not? These are all difficult. Um, and really what we can do the most with is to work with developing those intrinsic or inside desires of the student to want to learn. When we look at motivation, we have to find how the student can engage in the language materials that we're using and find some connection. So if we are doing a unit, for example, about sports, do you play a sport? What sport do you play? Tell me about your sport. Oh, do you know how to say this? Let's do a little drawing of a soccer field or a basketball court. And I want you to name all the things in English and tell me about how that works. When we take the time to personalize information for the less able student, all of a sudden they see, yes, this is important to me. And when they think it's important to themselves, they're going to participate a great deal more. Let's look at a task. When students who are less able in the classroom encounter the same materials as everyone else, they often fall behind because they don't get enough practice. What's the alternative? Well, we can ask the students to redo the tasks, to take them home as homework and to study them over and over again. But for many less able students, that can be a little bit boring. Instead, we can adapt those tasks in creative ways for use in the classroom, ways in which make them more memorable for the students. Let's take an example from Move It, Student Book 2. This is a task that centers around the idea of compound nouns. These ones are associated with sports and are things like hockey stick and swimsuit and soccer cleats. Students need to match the words with the pictures. But what else could we do with this? Let's look at five creative solutions to this problem of trying to find something new. First, we can turn the task into a pronunciation task, essentially making use of the student's listening and speaking skills as well as reading and writing. The students sit together in pairs and they just read the items back and forth to each other. It's very, very simple 
but there's a big side benefit here. Students are often shy, all students are shy, about putting up their hand and asking a question in the classroom. However, when they're just sitting next to each other, and it's just one other person, and they say, how do you say this? I don't know. They have the confidence that the other person can tell them without, you know, making fun of them. A second task is to look for similarities of some kinds. So we have words like soccer cleats and swimsuit. How do those go together? Well, they're both sort of clothing items that you need to put in on. We have hockey stick and tennis racket. They're both tools that you need to play the sports. When students look for these connections, for these similarities among objects, then they're developing other vocabulary items that tie them together. A third thing that we can do is to play a very simple game. And this simply involves one student reading the words and the other one having to quickly point at it. Or you can reverse it and do it the other way around. One student points to a picture and the other one has to say it out loud. This is actually teaching another skill besides making it memorable. The skill that it teaches is fluency. It teaches students to speak a little more quickly. A fourth task is another kind of a game. And in this one, you can ask students to say something like, I see something brown. And the other student has to look around and see, oh, judo belt, the judo belt is brown. I see something purple and pink, and they look around the pictures and they see, ah, the swimsuit is purple and pink. In this case, we're combining something else that the student already knows, such as colors, with something that is new to them, the sports items. In this case, you could look for other types of organizing principles, such as shapes or numbers. A fifth activity is another kind of a game. In this one, students can ask questions about something. Uh, for example, 20 questions. One student is looking at one of the objects and the other student says, oh, is it something that you wear? No, it's not something that you wear. Is it a place that you go? Yes, it's a place that you go. Is it a soccer field? Yes, it is, it's a soccer field. In these ways, the students are developing, again, other vocabulary around the issue. They're also just thinking about it differently. Again, like many games, you can play it the opposite way as well. You can ask students to describe something while the other one guesses what it is. All of these games and other tasks, alternative tasks to what we've been looking at in the book, are ways in which we can make it more memorable for the less able learner. At the same time, it also becomes more motivating and it becomes a break to the regular classroom routine. Use these activities and other ones you can think of and other ones your students can think of to enliven your classrooms and make them more welcoming to the less able student. In the third talk, I'm going to discuss the idea of the more able student because they can be a problem too. A more able student who is not challenged, who is not engaged, will become a discipline problem in the classroom. And we need to work with that.